In this episode, I speak with Dean Spillane Walker. Dean is the author of The Impossible Conversation, Choosing Reconnection and Resilience at the End of Business as Usual. He is the host of the Poetry of Predicament podcast, which I was a guest on uh, some time ago. Uh, And he also, if you want to learn anything about Dean, you can go to the website called livingresilience.net. You can also find him on Twitter at Safe Circle. So those are just some basic information to, to figure out who Dean is and what his work is about. But, you know, in his book, The Impossible Conversation, he addresses uh, his journey of coming to terms with the the sobering data, the difficult information that comes with understanding abrupt climate disruption, of understanding the very likely near-term extinction of not only the human species, but other species as well that live on this planet with us. Um, and he basically traces the the reasons, you know, gets to the reasons why this is happening. Um, and his own, of course, personal grieving and difficulty of coming to terms with this. Uh, this is not easy information to, to grapple with. And I've done, of course, numerous episodes uh, discussing this subject in some form or another. Uh, so, you know, Dean and I, we just sort of pick up our conversation from where it left off when we were discussing this on his podcast, The Poetry of Predicament, which you can find on YouTube. I'll provide a link to that down in the description of this episode. Uh, But Dean just does a really good job of communicating some of the very difficult subjects that come with having this conversation, right? The impossible conversation. How do you even begin to discuss these extremely difficult topics? I mean, even when you understand it, there's different uh, forms of denial and resistance to this information that comes up even for those that are fairly well versed in the data. You know, it's one thing to intellectually understand something, but it's a completely different thing in many cases to try to live with it, to try to know how to live in the face of this information. So we we have a wide-ranging discussion. Uh, we kind of go all over the place with this conversation, which is kind of what I wanted. You know, I think Dean... He, he's a really good conversationalist. He's somebody that I think we could probably talk for hours about a lot of these subjects, you know, getting into all the various, uh, uh, I guess, rabbit holes, you know, that, that pop up when we start to have these kind of conversations. And so it was really a great pleasure to speak with Dean again. I'm really happy that I could finally release this episode. I, re- I recorded it late last year. Uh, so it's been s- almost a one or two months, I don't even remember now, uh, when I recorded it. I'm sorry, Dean, that it took so long to release one of the challenging things, I think, that I didn't actually anticipate having, uh, you know, working on this podcast, at least at the beginning, was how I would, uh, it, working out the ways that these podcast episodes are released. I have like, you know, six to ten episodes lined up and trying to manage my time and how to set up interviews and and set up, you know, the appropriate time to release certain episodes based on on the content of each episode. So if some episodes are are very topical, right? They're like, okay, this subject is about something that's happening right now. I want to get this out as soon as possible. But I feel like this discussion in particular kind of a it's not as topical as other episodes I've had to release sooner than this. So again, I, Dean, I apologize for taking so long to release this damn episode, but I, that's not because I don't think it's important. I, I hope that is understood by anybody who has been either interviewed by me for this podcast or has wondered, like, why the hell is he taking so long to release this episode? It's a weird balance that I've been trying to uh, make. So if I had, you know, all the time in the world to do this, I would be releasing these episodes much more frequently. And I already think I release this podcast, you know, pretty regularly and really quite frequently. So it's it can be a lot of work. And I'm not complaining by that about that at all. I'm just sort of trying to clarify my position on that. Uh, but anyway, you know, this this interview with Dean, it was it was wide ranging and and you know, I, I really feel great knowing that there are people like Dean out there doing the sacred work that they are doing and creating space for people to express their their deep despair and sadness, their frustrations, their angers, their confusion about these subjects. We need people like Dean out there to make space for those things especially in a time of increasing uh, chaos. And, and as uh, Dean puts it, you know, we are in a, a predicament late in times. You know, these aren't problems that can be fixed. These are predicaments. These are, these are situations that we have been born into and that really have no viable solutions to. And we have to come to an acceptance of that. And that is incredibly difficult work. So 
Dean, you're courageous in doing that work. Thank you for having this discussion with me. And uh, I mentioned all of the ways you can get a hold of Dean or get to know Dean's work. I'll just mention again his book, The Impossible Conversation, uh, his website, livingresilience.net, and his Poetry of Predicament podcast. And of course, he's on social media as well, which I'll provide links to. And from what I understand, Dean is in the process of releasing a second book. So I look forward to seeing what he comes up with in the coming year. Uh, Dean, thank you for the time. Thank you all for listening to this introduction. Here is my conversation with Dean Spillane Walker. So, um, Dean, you were kind enough and you sent me a copy of your first book. I know you're working on your second book. Uh, The first book is The Impossible Conversation, Choosing Reconnection and Resilience at the End of Business as Usual. Um, I like the title. I think you get at kind of what you're going for and you talk about the impossible conversation. I remember the first time we spoke, we talked a little bit about how you do workshops and you try to get people to sort of address the implications of abrupt climate change. Um, and you talked a lot about the levels of resistance that we tend to have to this information. Um, has your views on that evolved since we talked last? It was a few months ago, but uh, you know, have you? Th- I'm sure you've thought about this because I've been thinking about this recently as well. I did a live podcast and I got to talk to groups of people about some of these subjects, um, and I can definitely feel kind of what you were addressing in that first time we spoke, which is this. You described it as I think you I think it was a really good term, uh, a membrane of resistance. <laughs> you know, and and I imagine that you've thought a lot about how to pass through that. You know, because everybody has their own unique resistance to this. Um, yeah, I just I just want to ask you like how how you have been personally grappling with this information, how your work is informed by this, and maybe what you were trying to get at with your first book regarding that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, it's it's really a, a joy to talk with you. Um, I think we have a lot of similarities, a lot of uh, parallel steps that we're we're taking on our different paths, and um, and I just really applaud the quality of of work that you do and the and the quality of people that you're that you're uh, interviewing. Um, I think you're just doing a really great job. And Thank to you. get Thank more you. to your question. Um, you know what I what I thought I'd like to do with you today, if uh, with your permission, is I'd I'd like to start us out with a poem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. And um, and why that is is uh, I think it speaks to a number of the membranes of resistance that we encounter, and certainly that folks like yourself or or me that we encounter because we're having a lot of impossible conversations with people we're we're really you know at this point we both have something to say about this the most difficult topic that humanity's ever had to face that almost no one is facing Mm -hmm. and uh, so within that tiny fragment of the human population that is engaged in any way in this conversation there's a particular piece of uh, poetry that that um, always wakes me up in in the best possible way and reminds me of of a particular type of humanity that i think we end up bumping into either either in ourselves or in our conversations so if i may it's called the dakini speaks by jennifer wellwood my friends let's grow up Let's stop pretending we don't know the deal here. Or if we truly haven't noticed, let's wake up and notice. Look, everything that can be lost will be lost. It's simple. How could we have missed it for so long? Let's grieve our losses fully like ripe human beings. But please, let's not be so shocked by them. Let's not act so betrayed as though life had broken her secret promise to us. Impermanence is life's only promise to us. And she keeps it with ruthless impeccability. To a child, she seems cruel, but she is only wild and her compassion is exquisitely precise brilliantly penetrating, luminous with truth. 
she strips away the unreal to show us the real. This is the true ride. Let's give ourselves to it. Let's stop making deals for safe passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. We're not children anymore. The true human adult gives everything for what cannot be lost. Let's dance the wild dance of no hope. I really like that. The wild dance of no hope. I really like that because it's it's touching on a lot of things that I, I think that that come with being a part of this culture in particular. This idea, like you said, that, that as you mentioned in the poem, the the secret promise that nature was supposedly supposed to give us, which is I think this idea of infinite human perfection and progress that like we're always going to head towards the sun, you know, like we're always going to like the tower of, you know, Babel, we're just going to make our way to heaven by our technological feats and our innate curiosity and cleverness. But that's not really what, uh, if we do have an innate cleverness and an innate curiosity, it certainly isn't to serve that, right? That's not, uh, the function of it, or at least that's not what it's supposed to, because we're coming up against some pretty serious uh, limitations in our ability to do that in the way that we're doing it. And that should be a wake-up call, but I think that, you know, I, I, it's funny, I was just, I, I recorded this several weeks ago, but I had an interview, a conversation with Mike Sleva, and you've, you've talked to him, you've has, you have his, uh, his series of videos uh, another way on your channel on YouTube, and, and we were discussing kind of the narrative, the story that we've been told in the civilization and and the expense of that narrative, like what really the, you know, what it does not only for us as individuals, but what it's doing to us collectively and how it excludes so much of the, the complexity and the wholeness of life on the planet. And there are certain things that wake us up to this predicament that show us really where we're at. Sometimes it's the sobering data that you talk about, the sobering data regarding abrupt climate change, abrupt climate disruption. And my, 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 I don't know if this is a naive approach that I've had, and I'm starting to kind of make more sense of it now, but doing my own work, trying to talk to people about it, trying to get them to address it, more and more people are waking up to it. But there is still this sneaky thing that happens where their resistance isn't that they're not accepting the data but that there's got to be some fix you know there's let me figure out there's like i have had a friend and, and he does it with the best intentions but he he went to the live podcast and he listened to what dar jamal had to say about it and and afterwards he's like Okay, so the oceans are so hot. Okay, they're getting, they're absorbing ninety seven percent of the heat or whatever it is. How do we cool down the oceans? And he has this really interesting idea involving rocks that absorb heat and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's amazing. Like, if you want to keep on doing that, but please don't bank on that saving us because the complexity of the problem is so vast that no one fix all solution is going to cut it. And I think that's what so many people are in right now is this like, how do we engineer our way out of this problem? But the severity of the predicament is so vast and so deep um, that we really have to abandon that notion. And um, I think you get at that in your work a lot too, that narrative of progress that is sort of an illusion. I think you get at that a lot. And what Mike, I guess my point was that Mike discusses that sort of addressing that privileged narrative that we've been kind of spoon fed our whole life. And yeah, anyway, I don't know if you had some thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, there's a, there are a couple things that um, I, I really committed myself as I'm now writing this second book. Um, the first one, as you mentioned, came out last year. And um, so I'm writing this one now, and there's a companion workbook with it to make it far more engaging. Because I, you talk about your naive part. I got a huge naive streak in me, but I thought, well, everybody will respond to this sober data that I talk about, you know, not just climate change, but 16 other, mm -hmm. you know, non-climate related 
vitally important <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> dangers um but there are a couple of of other pieces that have really uh kind of cracked through with my new uh level of commitment to making it accessible and engaging this the the work that i'm offering and uh one part of it is there's there's been quite a bit of conversation about the we're we're moved more by stories than by uh facts and we're in a post-truth world and you know nobody wants to hear the the facts they're not moved by the facts so don't even bother bringing it up and so on and so on and I find that there we're, we're collectively pretty sloppy with our language about, you know, basically nothing less than the potential extinction of humanity and not to mention <laughs> other species. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm just doing my best to ask the simplest questions I can and come up with the most workable possible responses. You know, I, I don't have any answers either, but you know, best, best case scenarios or best offerings that I can come up with. And uh, with regard to that, uh, our shared narrative. So what is the narrative that we are, that is so obviously uh, suicidal, ecocidal, and, and collapsing? What is it? And um, the relatively simple answer that I've come up with is that we, uh, may have come up, we may have come to America or come to the American dream or the business as usual human operating system with some sort of family narrative, if we were lucky, maybe a cultural narrative from wherever we grew up or our, our lineages. But I say that in order to work it out at, in America, which represents kind of the pinnacle of the business as usual paradigm, that we uh, really had no choice but to adopt the corporate charter as our core narrative. And the corporate charter has but one, you know, legal responsibility. It, by law, the, the, the folks that run that corporation, uh, their, jo their job is to provide profit for their shareholders, period. And there cannot be, there cannot be, that it's not legally possible for them to have a, uh, any sort of uh, predominant attention on their impact on communities or on nature or ecosystem. They, they just cannot do it. That's what we've got in our running through our bloodstream on an individual level, as well as a collective level. So built into that is all the stuff that Mike talks about so beautifully in his book on privilege. And so many of the other folks that you and I both interview, it's all built in there. So what helps me with that is it's not some vague thing about, so we're talking about some narrative or some core story, but very few people talk about, so what is that core story? It helps me a lot to have that rather simplistic um, possible interpretation set up as a cornerstone for the conversation. The other cornerstone I'd like to mention and, and hand it back to you to see if it sparks you at all is um, that uh, the really the uh, promise of this business as usual paradigm is that uh, if you want to um, reap any of the benefits of the business as usual paradigm, which is obviously the fossil fuel extravaganza that that's causing it all. That um, the the one ground rule at the center of it is you've got to disconnect from the primary sources of meaning in human life. I don't know if that conveyed to you in in the impossible conversation, but I, you know I'm really deepening that distinction in this book and workbook where. You know, it, it appears to me that in order to be functional as a part of the corporate charter as core narrative, I've got to literally cut off my inner sensitivities to my deeper self, to intimate relationship with other people of any kind, and then also with earth. Some would add a fourth one of, of soul, you know, so that, but you get the idea. 
I'm asserting that that is our, that the corporate charter or some variation of it is the core narrative that we've all adopted and the ground rule to be able to, to enjoy some of the perks of our world is to cut off, to disconnect from those core sources of meaning in life. The last cornerstone, and then I'm going to see what you think, is uh, that disconnection leaves us with immense blind spots in every dimension of our life. So while we're you know, celebrating being such geniuses and we've created such amazing things and this human extravaganza, um, I would assert that we are um, not nearly as present as we think we are in each of those dimensions. That we basically have no relationship, no formidable relationship with our deeper selves, with each other, and with the earth. And with those huge blind spots, the what fills in that hole is addiction. You know, I was just listening to this uh, a gorgeous podcast the other day from uh, uh, Gabor Mate was talking about. He's a, a remarkable expert in the field of addiction. And it, it's like he was just reading straight out of the, the next chapters of my book. It was just phenomenal. I, I so appreciate his, uh, his take on what has addicts be addicts. And what I'm asserting is the the business as usual paradigm is an addict and all of us immersed in it are addicts. So let me stop and just see if that sparks. Yeah, no, I think what you addressed is, is really poignant. It's really important to, to understand those levels that you, you talk about because I don't know, there's a lot of things that come to mind. There was, there was one, actually I just read, speaking of the thing I, I was looking at today, there's a article that I read I was shared by a guy I've, I featured on the podcast previously. His name is David O'Hara, and uh, he's a really amazing writer, and and he just does really. He's a, he teaches um, philosophy and classics at uh, Augustana University. But anyway, this, this article he shared it's uh, it's called "Can We Live in a World Without a Sabbath? Rethinking the Human in the Anthropocene." Really, quite a fascinating take on the creation story in the Bible and the and the role that the Sabbath has played in or lack of a Sabbath, I guess, this, this, this day that has been set apart every week in order for people to rest and let the land rest as well. Let the, let the beasts of the, you know, that are providing so much for, for human beings, let them rest on that day as well. And it's like also the seventh year, every seventh year, there's like a, another kind of year long almost version of that. Um, and then they have their Jubilee, which of course is like a, almost like a, 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 a absolving all debts and, and things like that. So, but, but there was this one section of this that I really liked. Um, and it was actually a quote from someone named Deepesh Chakrabarti. And it was the mansion of modern freedom stands on an ever expanding base of fossil fuel use. And, you know, you don't think about that, but you think about this, this, this privilege that we have, this notion that, Oh, well, everybody, our idea of freedom and being a free society is our ability to exploit the land, to exploit the so-called resources. And, you know, you talk about the sloppiness of our language. What better way to kind of detach us from the reality of what we're doing by calling a, a tar sand operation in Canada, which requires the absolute destruction of the boreal forest, the toxification of the soil and the land and the, the, the living beings of that land, in order for us to continue this addiction that you talked about in that third cornerstone, uh, that we call that development, we call that extraction, we call that all of these things, energy production, right? There's all of these words to obscure the very thing that we're actually doing, and it's all in economic terms, right? Because you know, and my my little rant, if I could say something, is trying to understand the predicament, like you like you've tried so so uh, in your work as well, where this narrative stemmed from, and it goes back hundreds or thousands of years. I mean, I had an interview with John Zerzan, who is this an, an you know he's like the anarcho primitivist, right? And he's written very extensively about where did we all go wrong, and he goes all the way back to 
the early days when human beings were nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes, and we began developing language, symbol, you know, symbol, sim, symbols to sort of explain or to communicate about reality. Uh, we, we talked a lot about the concept of time and how time as a quantifiable construct is imposed upon us, and that the further precision, I guess, uh, or, or the uh, exacting of, of time uh, serves a capitalist system very, very well. You know, I think when, there, when the Industrial Revolution came into existence, that, that's really when clocks became so central to our day and how our days were structured, right? You have to be at this place at this time and clock in. You give your time over to get money. Your money is directly related to time spent doing the labor. So, you know, where does that all come from? Where did that, that insecurity about these things come from? And and as you get into, I think, with that cornerstone number three, when you're talking about how it's almost like creating a positive feedback loop, because by being a culture that is as traumatized as we are, we replicate and exaggerate that trauma onto further generations and that detachment from the land that detachment from the the natural cycles of seasons of of the natural cycles of the human body and our human experience and trying to quantify that put it in a box and define it and, and label it and say it's this thing and this thing i feel like does us an enormous disservice because we're not really getting at the root of like when you talk about Gabor Mate, I, I've been following Gabor Mate for years and I've loved his discussion, his analysis of the problem because he asked the questions and he says this over and over again. It's like, we ask the question, why the addiction? But we should ask, you know, why the pain at the source of that? I think we often, because we are a culture, a society, a broad mass society, we often, I think, can put our responsibilities on something else right like the government is responsible or this or this entity is responsible we don't really realize our innate role within that and our inability unfortunately to completely detach ourselves from it I, that was actually the the discussion i had with mike uh that's coming out tomorrow is is not only the the attempt to get away from the center as i, re I wrote it in my description the center of the empire right trying to get away from that comfortable center and playing the game that even when you try to attempt to do that you become very much more aware of the privilege that you already have so if you're a white male living in america trying to get away from the center of empire that's all nice and good you should do that but you're going to become aware of how privileged you truly are because there's a lot of people that are not capable of doing that and i think part of my underlying message maybe with Mike was like, well, how the hell do I get away from this shit? You know, like I want to do it too, but you had savings, you had a job and a career for years to build the savings, to move away. And I'm like, most people don't have that. So my whole thing lately, I had an interview recently with a woman who is a part of the mutual aid disaster relief. And it's a, it's basically a non-hierarchical network that has been trying to address the climate catastrophes as they happen. So they were one of the first people to get into Puerto Rico and help the people of Puerto Rico because the government wasn't doing anything. The U.S. government said, oh, you know, you're basically, you're just a territory, you're not even a state. So we're not going to give you any resources. And even here in the continental U.S., the U.S. government still is very poorly equipped and capable of, of dealing with the wildfires in California and the refugees from that um, and, and the, the people that have been affected by these major hurricanes and tornadoes. I mean, it's getting worse. So how do we build systems and networks in place that are, exist outside of those structures? And I think that when you start to really start to get at it and you realize, like, we don't need this in, these institutions anymore to take care of us, what, what opportunities does that afford us? What opportunities does that allow us as people who are aware of the narratives that have been told to us? That human beings are totally and completely capable of existing outside of that paradigm. Oftentimes it takes a disaster for us to recognize this, but you know it could be a personal disaster, it could be a, a large-scale disaster, ecological disaster, um, but there are ways in which we can address the predicament in a much more wise way way um and i think that by putting that seed in people's mind right now especially it's going to benefit us later as those 
chickens come home to roost, so to speak. I don't know. That was sort of a weird rant. I went all over the place with that, but I, I hope that made some <laughs> some kind of sense to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd, I'd like to go back toward the beginning of what you were just saying. Um, you mentioned the word trauma and what was implied a, a couple of other times and other things you said is, is a level of violence, a violence that we perpetrate on on the earth, which is just incredibly obvious. And within my old guy lifetime, I'm clear, I will see massive failure, massive collapse of earth systems. And I think far sooner than that, I will see um, massive collapse of human systems. And the, the dynamic of those who uh, enjoy power, control, and wealth now, and, and really have all along, um, the dynamic between them and the rest of us um, is already remarkably twisted. It's the twisted inner roilings of an addicted society and, and all the addicts within it and there's not a one of us that has really our wits about us. You know, it's, we're just immersed in this craziness of, a, of an addict out of control. And the only way that, that the structures of business as usual <clears throat> can stay in place is through violence, is through this well-paved path that we've all walked on, we all walk in every day, which is paved with trauma. You know, the addiction comes because of that groundwork of trauma. And, and we've normalized it. So we take a look. It doesn't take much now, really. It's, it's actually hard not to get a little snarky as I'm writing this book. Like... <laughs> What the hell are we thinking? Yeah. How about just look around? You know, that we still have a conversation for more than half of America to be able to uh, be either in full denial or in some brand of willful ignorance. <sighs> just yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. That we can have people being treated the way they, they're being treated at almost every level of our society and we call it normal and we, you know, it's so swell that people want to get up and hold picket signs and still, you know, do, you know, some sort of uh, protesting and so on. Um, I certainly don't want to stop anybody from, from doing whatever they do at whatever level is right for them to be engaged in our world. But I, I, one thing I've really enjoyed that you've, you've brought in with a number of your guests, you know, that you all talk about violence and the as you know how it's it's really growing back out from the shadows big time, and um, I have a lot of concern. I have a lot of concern out of what I've seen um, in my own research, putting together the first book and now the second and so on. I think um, that we're delusional if we think that anybody at any level is just going to roll over, and all of a sudden there's going to be a whole lot less fossil fuel use, I, I think it's laughable and it's tragically laughable. And what I'm really concerned about, and I'm including this in the practices that I'm putting into the workbook and so on, is just how I'm not at all trying to say people should, you know, buy body armor and, and gun up and, and stuff. You know, people make the choices they make at that level and that's not where I'm talking. But I am talking about being street smart and shadow aware and just how in that addictive reality that we are all immersed in up to our eyeballs, what's in there, you know, with the addiction hand in hand is our shadow. That's what's running our country, running the world. And um, again, I'm just, I just have my sincere concerns that uh, people will somehow get um, hopeful and I'm, I, boy, I don't like using the word hope at all, but they'll get hopeful that, well, you know, we'll, we'll 
finally get some politicians in who really um, subsidize uh, renewable energy, and that'll take care of us, and we can get back to business as usual and a growth economy and everything will be fine. And I think you, you saw it in the impossible conversation, what, what the actual impossible conversation is, is the punchline of the book, is that we absolutely cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. And our entire business as usual model is based on the greatest growth trend that has ever been seen in any human venture ever. And it's, it must end or we will end, end it a different way. We'll end it in a very tragic way. So that's probably enough for my rant. Thank you. For oh, no, no. Yeah, no, this is, I figured this is how it's going to go. I just feel like there's a lot to discuss. So there's just so many avenues to take and how trauma fits into all of this is so fascinating because uh, that's something I've, I've uncovered over and over again is that I guess for me, I, I like to be diverse in, in what I like to talk about on the podcast because there's so many, you have to include the whole picture and try to get at the whole picture the best you can and all the different little aspects of that picture in order to get it. I mean, you know, why, why, why is it that, okay, you know, you just said this, why is it that subsidizing or, um, you know, doing carbon taxes or, or whatever it is, all these schemes, these economic and political schemes to, to get us to reduce our carbon uh, output, right? How do we mitigate that? And so much of that is based on this idea that we have to keep this economy going no matter what. So you have all these green capitalists, right? Like, well, we'll switch over to nuclear. We'll we'll invest and subsidize wind and solar and all this stuff. And they don't, of course, address the ins- unsustainability of those things in and of themselves. Because if they did, you know that. And Derek Jensen does actually a great job of doing that. I had an interview about that with him, kind of showing that. You know the whole paradigm of, of of sustainable energy is based on the exploitation, just in another way, um, and you know, and I I would think it about like you talk about keeping this this infinite growth paradigm going, and you try to think about well, what was it built on? You know, what was the what was the groundwork that was laid out for this? And that's built on settler colonialism. That is built on white privilege, which was formed in order to justify this exploitation of human beings. Um, and we're still perpetuating, it hasn't, you know, just because we outlawed slavery, except for prisoners, just because we have done all these things to kind of keep everything functioning and going along, just because people were so upset about it, they're like, well, we have to make some changes. It's kind of like New Deal Democrats, right? They're like, well, Roosevelt was a great president, and, you know, he saved this country from the Great Depression and all this stuff, and I'm like, I get that, but people don't actually recognize that the Communist Party in the United States at that time had, like, over a million votes or something like they were getting enormous support compared to you know what we had previously and since then people were ready to completely redistribute the wealth completely change the structure of the american economy and the capitalists are like well shit we got to figure this out so we're going to build a a robust more robust welfare state we're going to make it better we're going to try to we're going to try to make it better so that people will be less pissed off and i mean roosevelt was was basically credited with saving capitalism Okay, so a lot of the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves are just based on lies, based on keeping a violent, traumatizing system in place. Because, as the saying goes, you know, we we're, we can more easily imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. It's so abhorrent to even imagine because it's so tied with this notion of freedom, this idea that we have the ability as human beings now to make up our own lives and to decide what we want to do with ourselves and become entrepreneurs and business owners and all this stuff. And I'm like, I get that sentiment, but it's just so, so deeply attached to this notion that was, I don't even know when it began. Like I mentioned, I mentioned John Zerzan, but you could go to any point in human history and you can find out uh, how this whole thing was formed and constructed and perpetuated, how there were active forms of resistance to to undermine that and to go against it. I mean, I I have a special place in my heart for the Luddites. In in the Industrial Revolution in England, 1700s, you had these, it's kind of thrown around like they were anti-technology, and that's really not what it was about. That's kind of the modern conception of it. But they were breaking factory machines because they realized that, well, it was taking away their ability to live. But I think they knew 
on some level, based on what I kind of understand about them, that this new paradigm that was emerging with factories starting to be built all across England, I mean, literally everything changed within a few years. You had coal and steam engines and all this stuff in order to, to produce the energy needed to, keep, to, to meet this new demand. Um, was enriching a very small percentage of the population and they could see the environmental devastation, the ecological devastation that was starting to come up as a result of that. You know, you talk about the things that we don't notice anymore. You know, I, I mentioned in that live podcast this this thing, this insect apocalypse that's happening right now. When you drive your car, you have far fewer insects splattering the windshield, okay? It used to be you drive anywhere in the summer or spring or fall or whenever. You'd have just a massive, just screen of dead bugs just a genocide you know all across your windshield it's horrible but you but that was a re, a, a sort of like a, a a point that i touched on that now we don't have that anymore why is that we don't even notice that anymore we hardly even pay attention and when you bring it up you realize oh yeah this thing is happening and i wasn't even noticing it that's how disconnected we've become and and i think that the um our civilization, because it is based on these fundamental ideas of, of racial supremacy, of, of the exploitation of not only the indigenous peoples, but the land itself, that in order to perpetuate that myth, we buckle down even harder on them, and we want to fall into narratives and stories that make us feel better about that. And we cannot assume, as again, I, I feel a bit naive in this, assume that by presenting the sober data that people are just going to automatically want to join in with this sort of egalitarian effort to reconnect us to the land and the people and, and everybody comes together. That's the ideal. That's what we want. We hope that people come to that. But most people aren't going to do that. Um, it's going to probably get worse on multiple fronts. You know, this this disaster as it unfolds, uh, we, we, we need to start thinking about building those networks so that when it does fall apart, there's something available for people to understand um, that, you know, we can actually live um, in a much more simple but connected way. And that does not mean that we have to eradicate a large section of the human population in order to do that. Um, I think that that combating the narrative, and this is where the nuance comes in, right? It's, it's, it's it's a it's a complex problem, but there's a lot of nuance nuance that's required in order to convey this information to people in a very clear way, and that's when that's if you can do that, if people will listen, you have to sort of take that opportunity, I guess. Yeah. 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 You know, you you remind me of uh, a s online summit. Uh, symposium that uh, Carolyn Baker and I hosted uh, early this year um, called it a foot in two worlds and it, we invited a bunch of thought leaders from a number of different uh, fields to speak about their experience of their their perspective of what would it be like to actually consciously shift our lives from the business as usual world and our, our immersion in that up to our eyeballs, what would it be like to start to shift to consciously, you know, I, I often use this um, image of a, of a giant pool or a lake and that all of us are, are just sitting here, we're, we are all uh, treading water in this giant lake or, or huge, huge swimming pool. And, um, you know, every once in a while, one of us says, you know, God, it just seems like it's so wet, wet all the time. What's the deal? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about wet? You know, there's no wet. You can get the idea. You it's know, just, uh, <laughs> you're so immersed in this all the time. Yeah. And so what if there, there were a small handful of people who have actually found the edge of the lake or the pool and have found like, well, you know what, I, I'm going to try what it. What, what would it be like if I got out of this thing for, for a few minutes and actually started to dry off and so on? Uh, in any case, this, this uh, summit and the, the idea of a foot in two worlds, um, I actually turned it into a, a pretty major part of the, particularly the workbook that is the companion of, you know, with the, the two books that I'm writing now. And uh, 
and I articulate it as probably one of the toughest lifestyle choices that, it, that anyone could possibly make. So, you know, it actually behooves us to stay in denial and just keep riding this thing as far as we can ride it because it is an immense amount of work ethically on our hearts, on our souls, and, and every imaginable emotional and physical psychological aspect as well to try and hold this collapsing, clearly dysfunctional, clearly ecocidal paradigm. And then somehow with all of that, which is, you know, the vast majority of us are barely hanging in that. It takes everything we've got to just get through the day or the week, you know, in that. But somehow to be able to consciously bring one or two percent of our awareness and our intent over to create something else. It's, it's like, talk about the impossible conversation, like, oh, shit. How, how am I supposed to carve out any of my consciousness, any of my life energy to be able to, to try to put it towards something that hasn't been articulated yet, hasn't been imagined yet? That's a, it's, it's an immense challenge. So I, I just want to put out a you know, message of compassion to us all. Because what, what you and I are talking about right now is, is just so extraordinarily difficult. If you don't mind, I'd love to just pause us, just slow us down for a second. And maybe the listeners as well, and just, just allow even a small portion of this conversation to just sink into the level where we could actually feel it for a moment. You know, the, the amount of trauma that we now normalize every day. It's, for, for me personally, having been in, in this arena for quite a while in the, in the training work that I've done and facilitation and so on, it's hard not to be in tears. You know, you've recently done um, an interview with some folks that I, I really enjoy around grief. Um, and, and that is a big part of my work because we are such a grief phobic and pain phobic culture, which is so ironic because we are so immersed in pain and, and loss. And it takes immense amounts of life energy to be willfully ignorant of that which we are losing or the trauma that we're experiencing. So thanks for just letting me slow it down for a second and, and just get a little bit closer because, you know, one thing I notice is uh, as good as, as our podcasts might be or our conversations or our inter interviews might be, the vast majority of it is heads talking to heads in that, very much disconnected way. I'm certainly guilty of it a lot. And there is no freedom down that direction. There is no possibility. There is no more beautiful world our hearts know is possible down that tunnel of conversation that is head talking to head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the trap is that this technology we have is amazing. I've, I've talked to people from all over the world. Um, the fact that I get to do that and then record it and then put it in a thing and make an episode and put it out there and people can listen and have their, you know, their own responses to it. That's an amazing thing, but it's no substitute for the face to face human to human connection, right? It's a completely different dynamic. And I almost feel like, I actually got an email recently from, a, I think, uh, I don't know who, I won't say the name of the person, but they they had, I think they heard, I don't remember what episodes they were hearing, but they, they, they were like, I live in Utah, and I'm witnessing my the ecosystems collapsing, the water is disappearing, um, uh, the fresh water is disappearing, 
I don't know what to do. I, I've talked to some people about it, and I think they're starting to understand what's happening. But I just don't even know where to go with this. And for some reason, I never anticipated that doing this would have people... I know that's really naive, again, naive of me, but I'm learning as I go along that I may have to help people and direct them towards resources and people near them, not people online. I mean, they, that might be helpful too. They may help them in ways I can't. But this person was in a particular geographical location, and they're like, who can I talk to in my area? So I had to ask other people. I asked uh, the many good people you mentioned the interview you're talking about with the uh, Good Grief Network, uh, Amy and Laura from there. Uh, they have their own amazing 10-step like group program that they're working on to help people grapple with these heavy emotions that come with this ecological consciousness, right, that's starting to emerge again. Um, and then I also had a, a friend, uh, Rob Simetz, who you've featured on, on a previous episode, who I, I love. I've become good friends. Another person that I would like to meet in person. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do that next year. Um, but uh, anyway, the, the I asked both of these people, like, I don't know where to direct these people. And, and they were very good about giving me some directions. And, and I never anticipated that would be, I don't know why, and that's really foolish of me, but I never really anticipated that there's going to be people that are coming into this information. It's going to be new to them. I've had a few years to grapple with it. I'm still have my moments of extreme sadness and grief and over being overwhelmed by the information. It's like, it comes in waves. It never goes away. And I feel those different stages of grief at different times. It's not this linear, you know, I'm set, I'm this and this and this all in one string. And then I come to acceptance and everything's, you know, that's not how it works. It's very nonlinear. You, you're going to approach the different stages in your own unique way. Um, but then realizing like I'm putting out a signal with this podcast, you're putting out a signal with yours. There's going to be people that are going to start coming into this awareness and they're going to be in a very vulnerable state emotionally. Um, and how do I direct those people in a very productive direction for them personally, where they can not only begin to grapple with that grief and that feeling, but also find resources that, and you know, it, it is, it is important to sort of hold yourself back when you say hope, because it's not about finding solutions. It's about finding personal fulfillment in that state that we're going to find ourselves in as a result of coming becoming aware of this information. Hope isn't something that's meant to lead us towards false conclusions or false solutions. Hope is a place where we can reside that allows us to feel connected to ourselves and to others when maybe we previously never felt that way. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's really what I want to get at when I talk about abrupt climate change is, okay, this is happening. Why do you think that is? I've heard people say, well, human beings are rotten. We're a rotten species. We've done rotten things. And I really want to then take the next step and say, that's not why. It's only some people that have done this, not all human beings. There's countless human beings that have left zero to no negative impact on this planet at all. Why is it that our culture is producing this? And then from there, there's a step-by-step -step process of recognizing the, maybe not the exact root, but at least something close to that, finding that center of where that, that trauma stems from. And there's so much to unpack and there's so many avenues to go down and each person's going to come at it in their own unique way. And I just hope that by us addressing all the various aspects of this in our own way, that people will come to that realization and they won't come to this place of resentment and hatred, that they'll come to a place of, yes, it's sad, but it's also incredibly beautiful sadness as well that can come with that. Um, and uh, yeah. I don't know what else to add to that, but I, I just want people to know that are listening to this episode or any other episode I've done or that you've done, that we're more than happy, I think, to help. And that I'm probably not going to have an answer for you for a lot of the questions itself, but I can at least try my best to direct you in a direction that may be fruitful for you. Um, I think one of the major gifts that I've received in doing this work for me personally is making all of these profound connections with so many beautiful human beings around the world that are doing incredibly important work, but they're just not being necessarily given the attention that I think they deserve. Yeah. Well, what you have just been talking about these last few minutes is, is exactly the track that I, I found myself on after I vetted the, the initial round of information that just blew my, my mind. And 
you know, what, what I was clear on from that moment on was that I, I'm not going to save the world. I, it's, there's nothing to save. There's nothing to fix. That it's worse. We've missed all the off ramps that would have been would have made that sort of thing possible. And so what I wanted to do was just bring my gifts to humanity and gifts to the earth and bring those gifts with as much light and love and grace as I can possibly muster. And that's what had me do this, um, these few years of working with Carolyn Baker and creating living resilience, uh, you know, the website and the, the online content that's coming out about that. Um, the new book and workbook combination is exactly designed to be, to in, invite people to create their own path through this extraordinary, easily the most difficult conversation that humanity has ever had to grapple with. And so um, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing is, is what you just said, you know, is, is seeing the pain, seeing the loss and um, experiencing so many different perspectives about it. And there are, very, very few people who are offering anything particularly that has traction to it. That is, uh, you know, something that people can actually engage with and, and find useful. Um, the vast majority of uh, social services and mental health, uh, I, you know, been researching this an awful lot. And um, I've, I've found there are a couple of providers that are, are offering things that people can learn in a very short period of time and take home and, and teach their family members to use it to, to be able to self-regulate, you know, cause we just, again, we don't have a conversation in our culture about this. That's, that's how we got to normalizing all this trauma is we just override and we don't have an awareness of what we're actually carrying. And so you know, at one of the most important steps that I think you know, that this troubled person that you're talking about that might be listening to a podcast and wondering, what can I do? One of the most important things will be to find, uh, find some assistance in being able to self-regulate, to be able to know, okay, what is the optimal state that I would like to be having in my body? what's actually going on when I'm feeling as upset and as anxious as I am, whatever the, or depressed. And how do I shift that? You know, and, and then another obvious step out from there is how do you connect with other people? How do you find your people? Cause one thing that's very, very clear to me is that these, this is not a good thing to try and do alone. Certainly we all need alone time, but, this is not the kind of thing that any of us is capable of handling fully alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's sort of the thing. And that was something that Laura and Amy from Good Grief Network said, is that a lot of people that are coming to these groups, these sessions where they go over these 10 steps that they cultivated, um, that a lot of people are just dealing with isolation. They're feeling alienated. They don't know who to address or to talk to. And then a lot of these online communities that are – addressing this as well like this is sort of a support group right like um, near-term human extinction support group on on facebook there's that one um they're they're great the the administ the uh, administrators of that i think vanessa blakesley and i think uh, wendy I'm say your name last name bandusky i think is her last name uh there there are a few people that have been on that community and have really been very good about uh, cultivating an environment for people to express through that medium to express their feelings, their ideas, you know, their, how they're reacting to new data that's coming out and all that. I mean, it's just sort of a wave, a constant wave of emotion, I feel like, that people are experiencing when they come across this. But online community does not substitute, is not a substitute for real community. And, and that's why the more, more and more people become aware of this, we have to have those, those structures in place, and they need to have certain principles and values that are going to um, allow it to be open to anybody that is willing to have the conversation and wants to really delve into the deepness of it. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people coming at it from different angles, but I think that it's all valuable. Um, yeah. 
So uh, we've been talking for about an hour, a little over an hour at this point. Um, and uh, I just want to turn people on to, to where they can find your work. Uh, you have your website, livingresilience.net. There is your uh, Poetry of Predicament podcast, which is on YouTube. And uh, you are on Facebook. I know. You, I think maybe you're on Twitter. I could be wrong about that. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter way more than Facebook. I'm not a, I'm not a big Facebook fan. Yeah, and that's understandable. I completely get that. <laughs> it's kind of a weird place. Um, and then you have your book, The Impossible Conversation. Uh, you have your second book that you're working on. Do you have a title for that? Uh, do you know how long it'll be before you have that kind of worked out and, and set for, for release? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, doing everything I can to have it ready uh, in January. Oh, okay. Wow. It's coming up soon. Yeah, and it's um, it's going to have something to do with being collapse aware. Okay, okay, wonderful. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what uh, comes out of that book. Um, and uh, again, I appreciate you for sending your first book to me. I had a chance to go over that, and I I do recommend that people, especially that are coming into this awareness about this information, it's a good place to start. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to say before we go. I would uh just like you to kind of there's any any last thoughts that maybe things I forgot to cover or things that you wanted to address that I, I didn't get at you know it's it's really funny that I, I asked a similar question of Rob Simons the other day when I was interviewing him and and um, and he said something along the lines of uh, suggesting that people slow down and um, I think that that's that's certainly the advice I've been giving myself. That's the, the direction I've been going is to um, really all the practices that I've got in my life, I are gauged or are directed toward reconnecting, reconnecting those core sources of meaning in life that we all have disconnected. And, uh, the pace of the business as usual world is so fast and it's so intense and we are so distracted that trying to reconnect at that pace is, is just extraordinarily difficult if, you know, if not just really impossible. And um, so I'd, I would like to invite anyone that has the slightest interest or attraction to the conversation that we, you and I have been having today to slow down and to really look at the, as close to your core as you possibly can and look at really, this may seem ridiculously obvious, but I suggest starting with re-looking at what matters most to you. I think that, that that question gets answered very differently if we're in the rapid fire world of business as usual, as opposed to shifting our attention and our intent to reconnecting with the web of life. And so to slow down and give yourself the, um, the extraordinarily be extraordinary benefit of asking that question what matters most to you and uh yeah i just uh, appreciate very much having this conversation with you and uh look forward to seeing who uh <laughs> who each of us gets to talk to in this coming year and I wish us both uh, the opportunity to do that kind of slowing down and to ask those core questions and uh, hopefully be of service to others who are uh, stepping in that same direction. Yeah, well, that's a really good note to uh, end this discussion with you, Dean. I really thank you for your time. I thank you for sharing your insights with me today. All right. Thanks, Thanks. Patrick.